The land of Israel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our weekly Pasha Shir. This week we're studying Pasha Shlach, Pasha Svayishlach. The land of Israel, the Eretz Yisrael, will of course one day be divided up among the 12 tribes. The base Hamikdash would one day merit, uh, would one day be built in the portion of Binyamin. The reason for that, the rabbis say, is because of the entire family of Yaakov and his 12 sons. The only one who does not actually bow down to Esav is Binyamin. The story takes place in this week's Parsha where the dreadful meeting, the meeting which is dreaded between Yaakov and Esav finally takes place. Yaakov bows down to Esav seven times. His wives, his sons, everybody bows down to Esav. Um, and the meeting miraculously or seemingly miraculously ends really well. <coughs> Excuse me. Esav accepts the gifts. According to Rashi, Esav concedes uh, his rights to the brachas that Yaakov had taken from their father Yitzchak. Um, they seem to make up. In fact, Esav even offers to accompany Yaakov on this continued journey. Uh, Yaakov seems to decline, but but the Posuk makes it clear that they embrace and they hug each other and they kiss each other and they cry. The only one who does not engage in the actual bowing down to Esav is Binyamin. Again, Yaakov and his other 11 sons all bow down. In this Zechus, Binyamin merits that the Beis HaMikdash is built in his chilek, in his portion of Eretz Yisrael. In that sense, he's seen as the only one uh, who remains pristine, who remains pure, as having never bowed down uh, to Esau. In the story of the Megillah, um, we spoke about this Medrash last year when we learned Parshas Vayishlach. In the story of the Megillah, when Mordechai refuses to bow down to Esau, um, Esau, excuse me, in the story of the Megillah, when Mordechai refuses to bow down to Homan, um, Homan, the rabbis, the Medrash says, quotes this story in the Chumash um, to justify his desire, his, his request that Mordechai should bow down to him. He, he tells Mordechai, or he has messengers tell Mordechai, look, Yaakov and all of his sons bow down to Esau in order to save his own, his own life. It's okay. You, Mordechai, can bow down to me as well. Mordechai refuses. He says, I am Ishimini, a descendant of Binyamin. Binyamin was not alive at the time. And therefore, uh, and therefore Binyamin uh, does not bow down to Esau. And so Mordechai says, I, as a descendant of Binyamin, I'm not going to bow down either. Okay. Today, we're going to learn about someone else that doesn't bow down to Esau. If you have a Chumash in front of you, um, turn to Perak Lamed Beis, chapter 32, Posuk Chav Gimel, verse 23. The Posuk, this is before the meeting of Yaakov and Esau. It's even before Yaakov wrestles with the angel of Esau. It says, Vayokom Balailahu, that he, Yaakov, gets up on that night. He takes his two wives, Rachel and Leah. Ves Shtei Shivchoisav and his two maidservants, Bilo and Zilpa. Ves Achad Osa Yelodov and his 11 children, 11 sons. Vayavor Esmavor Yaboik, and he crosses a river. According to Rashi, the name of the river is Yaboik. All right. This is the Torah is introducing the famous story about how he brings them across the river and he goes back for some pachim ketanim. He goes back for some small jugs and he remains alone and he's, he, he wrestles with the angel of Esau. Okay. But Rashi on this posuk jumps. The posuk says he takes, again, he gets up in the middle of the night, he takes his two wives, his two maidservants, his 11 children, and they cross the river. Says Rashi, but ah, that's achad also yelodov. Says Rashi, whoa! Vedino haichan haisa. What do you mean he takes, takes his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons? Where's Dina? And says, Rashi, Nosna Beteva, Venual Befoneha. He placed her in a box and he locked it. Shalayitin bo Esav Enov. He didn't want Esav to see her. Ulakach Nenash Yaakov, Shemono Meochiv. And actually, Yaakov is punished for doing this, for withholding his daughter, Dina, from his own brother, Esau, if Dina had in fact married Esau, 
there was the possibility that she would make him a Balchuva, she would bring him back to the good path, she would, she would be Makar of him. Um, Yaakov hides Dina from Esav, locks, puts, Yaakov hides Dina from Esav, puts her in a box and locks it. Yaakov is punished for this, and he is, uh, he's, he's punished for this because had she married Esav, perhaps she would have been able to make him a Balchuva, make him from again. V'nofla biyad shechem, the punishment is that she ends up falling in the hands of Shem. And the Rashi, Rashi quotes this from the Medrash. According to this, Rashi and Medrash, Dina also does not bow down to Esau, not because she wasn't born yet, she was, not because she wasn't there, she was, but she was hidden in a box, placed in a box, uh, uh, in the words of Rashi, placed in a box and locked the door in front of her because Yaakov was protecting her from Esau, for which for which Yaakov is punished. Had he allowed Dina to marry Esav, says Rashi, quoting from the Medrash, who knows, Shema Tachzirenolomutov, perhaps she would have been able uh, to get him to become a, to become a Baal Teshuva. Okay. The Rashi and the Medrash is difficult to understand. Number one, how can you ever ask a father to allow his own daughter to marry a Russia like Esav? Question number two, the punishment doesn't seem to fit the crime. It wasn't just Yaakov who was punished in the story of Shem. It was also Dina. What did Dina do wrong? Why does she have to suffer? Number three, the reason why, the Torah tells us, uh, the reason why Leah's eyes were so delicate, were so soft, is because Leah would cry a lot. Why would Leah cry? She would cry because she didn't want to end up getting married to Esau. She was destined to get married to Esau. She didn't want to marry Esau, so she would cry. By Yaakov marrying her, uh, Yaakov actually saves her from, from being married to Esau. So why is, it, why is it okay for Leah not to be married to Esau, and yet Dina does have to be married to Esau? And worst of all, Rashi himself is not even saying that had she married Esau, uh, she would have brought him back. Rashi is saying had she married Esau, she may have been able to bring him back. Why should Yaakov put his daughter Dina in harm's way just for the chance? Okay. A couple of verses later in Perak Lamed Dalet, verse chapter 34, Pasuk Aleph, the Torah introduces us to the famous story of Dina. The Pasuk says like this. Dina, Dina, the daughter of Leah, who was who was born to Yaakov, goes out to see the daughters of the land. And here there is a commentary from the Balaturim. The Balaturim on the word bivnois and the daughters says, Shnaim b'mesaira. Typical Balaturim style. He says the word bivnois, excuse me, appears twice in the entire Torah. Once over here, that Dina, the daughter of Leah, was born to Jacob, goes out to see, quote, <coughs> the daughters of the land. And the second time, the, oh, the, only, <coughs> the only other time we find the word Bivnois is, quote, With regard to Shimshin, we find the expression in the Pasuk, Bivnois Achecha, the daughters of your brother. Okay, I'll explain soon what the context of that is, but there's an expression of the Pasuk, the daughters of your brothers. Asher Gabi Shimshin, written concerning Shimshin. Loimar says the Baal Aturim, this teaches us, the other time the Torah uses the word is the daughters of your brother. The Baal Aturim echoes the same concept. Since Yaakov didn't want to give Dina to his brother Esav, Kedisa Bemedrish, as the Medrish says, she itmina beteva, he hid her in a box, Iponov. Nena, she was punished. She yotza lirois bivnois aores, that Dina went out to see the daughters of the land, Uba lo Shem, and she was, and she was taken, she was taken by Shem. So the Balaturim is saying, in no uncertain terms, he's echoing Rashi's, uh, he's echoing Rashi's quote from the Medrish, that Yaakov is punished 
um, in that Dina goes out to the daughters of the land and taken by Shem, he's punished because he placed Dina in a box, preventing, from ex- preventing her from being exposed to Esav. And the Balaturim in his style says, we see this because the word bivnois is used twice in all of Tanakh. Once in our parsha, bivnois oretz, Dina goes out to see bivnois oretz, the daughters of the land. And the other one by Shimshon is bivnois achecha, the daughters, where the Torah uses the word bivnois, right next to the word achecha, your brother. Again, in Shimshon, it's a different context. We'll get into it right now. But, again, but the Balaturim's point is the word achicha, achecha is written right there to show us that it was because of something to do with Yaakov and his brother, Bivnois Achecha, that that's why Dina ends up going out to the daughters of the land and getting captured. All right, this is, this is what's written here in, in the Balaturim. Okay, so what does he want with, with, so what does he want with Shimshin? So Shim, the story of Shimshin is written, is recorded by the Torah in Sefer Shoftim over a couple of Krakim. Um, the Torah, of course, introduces the story very, very famously. Shimshin had a great father who was a very big tzaddik. His name was Manoyach, and Manoyach and his wife were barren. They had no children. And one day an angel comes to them from Hashem and tells them, you're going to have a child. He's going to save the Jewish people from the plishtim, amazing, and give them all sorts of instructions. He's going to be a Nazir, he's going to be a Nazirite, etc. Okay, not for now. The bulk of the story of Shimshin, the Torah spends talking about Shimshin's relationship with non-Jewish women. The story of Shimshin is, is, is very, very layered and very nuanced and, and there's much to it. But again, the bulk of it talks about Shimshin's engaging with non-Jewish women. It starts, the story begins in, 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 in Shoftim Perek Yudalit. It says, Vayeret Shimshin Timnosa. Shimshin goes down to a city called Timna. Vayar Isha Timnosa. He sees a woman in, Tish, in Timna from the daughters of the Plishtim. And he comes back and he tells his father and his mother, I've seen this woman and um, I want to marry her. And he asks his parents to arrange it. Shoftim, Sefer Shoftim, Perak Yudalit, Pasuk Yimam. And his father and his mother say to him, quote, Ha'ein bivnois achecha uvachol ami isha. Is there no wom- is there no women, is there no, excuse me, is there no woman among your brothers and all of my nation that you go to take a wife, me plishtim ho'arelim from the uncircumcised plishtim? What is wrong with you, Shimshin's parents say to him? We raised a fine young, young son. We raised a fine young man. We sent you to the best yeshivas and Talmud Torahs. <laughs> we gave you the best possible education. We surrounded you with the most wonderful living examples of good Jews. And all you can talk about is shiksas and marrying a shiksa and noch from Timna. Vayoyma Shimshin al Oviv and Shimshin says to his father, Oysa Kachli, take her from me, ki hi yoshra be'enai, for she is good in my eyes. V'oviv ve'imoy lo yodu, concludes the Torah, his father and his mother, Shimshin's father and mother don't know, ki me Hashem hi, that all of this is being orchestrated by Hashem. Shimshin is, is I think the best way to translate it is that Shimshin is looking for an excuse to battle the Plishtim. At that time, the Plishtim are ruling over the Jewish people. Shimshin knows that the purpose of his shlichas, the purpose of his mission in this world is to battle the Plishtim, is to, is to wrestle them, uh, is to successfully um, secure the Jews' position from a security perspective. And so in order to do this, he, he needs an excuse to wrestle, to battle them. And so he needs to marry this woman um, from Timna, a Plishti woman, and everything, that, and everything evolves from there. In fact, that's exactly what happens. Shimshin does uh, marry her. Shimshin, does, the marriage does turn into, uh, uh, does to become contention, contentious between Plishtim and, and, and Shimshin. And because of that, Shimshin does turn on the Plishtim 
and begin to 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 kill them, thereby securing the position of the Jewish people from a security uh, from a security perspective. But again, the expression. Oh, and, and the Torah says that Shimshin's father and mother, despite the fact that Shimshin's father was a great tzaddik, Shimshin's parents don't know Kimei Hashem, Yotz, uh, Kimei Hashem, uh, Kimei Hashem he, that this is from Hashem. They don't know that. Shimshin, it seems, does know it, and so he marries this woman and, uh, and, 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 and fulfills what it is that he's supposed to do. All right, the Rambam explains that Shimshin, of course, converts the woman before he marries her. The Rambam discusses why the Torah doesn't say that. Um, you know, the Torah just makes it sound like he does marry a non-Jewish woman. Also, not, not for now. But I just want to highlight the point. What the Balaturim is saying is that since the word bivnois is only used two places in the Torah, one by Dina uh, going out to see bivnois oretz, and one by Shimshin whose father and mother tell him isn't there among the daughters uh, of your brothers and my nation isn't among the Jews a, a, a woman for you and in the second place the expression is from here you see that Yaakov is punished with Dina being taken captive for not giving his daughter Dina to his own brother Asaph. all right this is this is what the Balaturim what the Balaturim writes okay with regard to the story of Shimshin and his insisting on marrying, in this case, a non-Jewish woman, um, or, excuse me, what the Torah refers to as a non-Jewish woman, again, the Rambam says he converted her. Um, actually, the story of Shimshin is that after this woman from Timna, he marries another woman from Aza. Does that sound familiar? Right, he marries a woman from Aza. And then he ends up with a, with a third woman from the, from the non-Jewish nations. The third one, of course, is the most famous. The third one is Delilah, or in English, Delilah, where there the famous story emerges, how Delilah is the one who eventually extracts from him the secret of, of his strength. But again, most of the, the real estate, most, most of the time this Torah spends speaking about Shimshin is about these women and the stories involved, the experiences involved in, in him marrying. Okay. In a sefer called Kehilas Yaakov, which is primarily a, a Kabbalistic sefer, in a sefer called Kehilas Yaakov, there is an explanation in a spiritual sense as to why Shimshin is, is attracted or why, or why it is that Shimshin knows that he has to marry these women specifically um, that emerge from the Goyim. Again, the Rambam says he converted them, but their conversion was, was their conversion was halachically, um, was, was halachic, was, was halachically, how do we say this nicely? Their conversion was halachically strenuous. And so the Torah presents it this way, that, that he just saying that, he's, that he married the woman from, from these non-Jews, from these non-Jewish nations. So in this sefer called Kehilas Yaakov, he says like this, he says that Shimshin was a Gilgul, was a reincarnation of Nodav and Aviyu. Nodav and Aviyu are two sons of Aaron who died the day the Beis Amikdash was inaugurated. Shimshin is a Gilgul of Nodav and Aviyu. Now it's interesting because you don't often find that two people are reincarnated into one person. You don't often find that. But here it is in the Sefer Kilas. Yaakov, Nodav and Aviyu are reincarnated into, into Shimshin. Why is that significant? Well, hold on to your heads. You see, Nodav and Avihu, one of the reasons that they die, as we've learned, the Gemara, the Medrash says, is because they never had children and they never got married. So, says the Sefer Kilas Yaakov, it works like this. If a person doesn't get married, then they come back in another lifetime. In the next lifetime, they have to try to fix the fact that in their previous lifetime, they didn't get married. 
But here's the catch. If in the first lifetime, the person tried to get married, but didn't succeed. In other words, they, they, were, they, they attempted, they, they involved themselves, they worked at it. Just for whatever reason, it didn't happen. Then in the following lifetime, the tikkun, the tikkun is the, the following experience is that they're born and it's very easy for them to find their bashert. So maybe for those the, for, to, to find their bashert means the person they're supposed to marry. So maybe for those who have a very easy time, love at first sight, finding the person they're supposed to be married to and staying married to them for their entire life, it could be the reason for that is, or one of the reasons is because in their previous life, the Gilgal Rishon, they were trying to find their destined second half of the neshama, and for whatever reason, didn't find it. If, on the other hand, a person lives a life and and didn't even try to get married, then when they come back in the following lifetime, and now they have to fix the fact that in their previous lifetime, they didn't get married and, and, and didn't have children, they are born, according to Sefer Kilas Yaakov, without ever being able to find their other half. They're, they're, they're born without being able to find their bashert. Based on this idea, he gives an interpretation in the following pasuk. Listen to this. This is a pasuk in Parshas Mishpatim. Speaking about, on the surface, the pasuk is speaking about an Eved Ivri, a, a Jewish slave. The Pesach says like this, in Bagapo Yovoi, Bagapo Yetze. In Baal Ishohu, Vyotso Ishto Imoi. Again, in Bagapo Yovoi, Bagapo Yetze. In Baal Ishohu, Vyotso Ishto Imoi. On a simple level, the Pesach is saying like this, in Bagapo Yovoi, if the Eved, if the Jewish slave, entered his servitude, entered working for his master while he was single, he leaves single. In Baal Ishahu, if he comes with a wife, when he's freed, his wife goes free together with him. In Kabbalah, it says like this, in Bagapo Yovoy, Bagapo Yetze means if a person lives a life and doesn't seek to get married, doesn't seek to have children. Bagapo Yetze, when the person comes back in the following lifetime, they're once again born without a bashert. No one for them to marry. Now, what is that? does that mean that the person actually never gets married or that the person has to struggle to find the person they're destined to get married? Or, 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 or does that mean that they'll marry somebody but this, the person is not their bashert? It's pretty strong. Um, what it says is, can you sure so so we shall remain I, I, I believe what what that means is the person has to work really hard to to, to find a person that destined to marry in bal isha who means if the person did try in their previous life to find their bashar to get married etc but they weren't successful the yotsa ishta imai his wife is the the woman he's destined to marry comes back into the world together with him and they're able to find each other uh, able to find each other easily why is this important because as i said before shimshin is a reincarnation of nodav and aviu shimshin is a reincarnation of nodav and aviu means He's a reincarnation of two individuals who didn't get married. And not they didn't get married because they tried and they didn't succeed. They didn't even try. Nodav and Aviyu were two sons of Aaron. The Medrash says, why did they not get married? Why? They actually believed that no one was good enough for them. They said, we're the sons of Aaron Kohen Godel. We're the nephews of Moshe Rabbeinu. We are, uh, we are, uh, what did it say? We are uh, uh, the nephews of, of Nachshin ben Aminodov, I believe, right? We are Kohanim. They said, no one's good enough for us. 
Shimshin was their reincarnation. So Shimshin was telling his parents, or Shimshin knew himself, that he's going to have a really, really hard time finding a Shidduch. Because, in, again, in his, in his previous lifetime, he is a Bagapa Yovel, Bagapa Yotze. He's coming from two individuals who considered themselves too, uh, too lofty, too great. Um, no one was good enough for them. So that's in the spiritual sense, that's the reason why Shimshin believes that he has to go and marry converts, women who've converted from, from non-Jews, because within the Jewish nation, he doesn't have a bashert. Begapo Yovei, Begapo there's no, There's no one there for him. If Noda Venavi would have tried to get married and not succeeded, then Vyotza Ishta Imoi, he would be able to find his bashert even easily among the Jewish people. But since they didn't, and they held themselves too arrogant, too, too haughty, too great. Therefore, Shimshin says, I have no choice. I have to go and marry these women that are coming from, from Timno and from Azo and, and, and Delilah and all of these women that come, that, that come from non-Jews. Okay. I'll tell you what I think this means. I'll tell you what I think this means. And how, and how is this connected to Dina, right? The Balaturim says the only two places in the whole Chumash where the word Bivnois is used is by Dina and by Shimshin. What's, what's, what's the connection? Dina and, Dina and Shimshin. What, what, what's one thing got to do with the other? Let's go back to Noda Venaviu, because again, Shimshin is a reincarnation of Noda Venaviu, and that's the reason, according to Kabbalah, why Shimshin believes that he has to marry these women from the non-Jewish from, from the non-Jewish nations. Not of an avu don't marry. They say we're two, we're Kaihanim, sons of Moshe Rabbeinu, as the sons of Aaron, nephews of Moshe. There's no one good enough for us. It's one of the reasons, going to the Medrash, it's one of the reasons actually why they die. Okay. So perhaps, perhaps. In a spiritual sense, here's what this means. Marriage doesn't just represent a relationship between two human beings, right? When a couple, I, I, do, um, I do sometimes chosen classes, right? I train young men before they get married. And, and one of the things we teach them is that marriage is not just the beginning of a relationship, right? Marriage is not just, uh, you know, now you have... Now, now you enter into a relationship, a very special and loving relationship. Please God, uh, an eternal relationship. It's more than that. Marriage is actually a new phase of life. You have the person has to understand when they get married, a new, a new stage in life begins. Practically, it manifests itself where you now have additional responsibilities. Practically, it manifests itself, please God, they'll be blessed with children, they'll start a family, right? It's not just a marriage that begins, it's, it's additional financial responsibilities, it's additional familial, familial responsibilities, it's additional communal responsibilities. When a person gets married, we call them a, balab a balabayas. You need, you need to now be the master of your own home. Marriage is a new phase in life. When a person gets married, they need to take real responsibility for themselves, for their place in the world, for their relationship with the Jewish people. They need to understand that they're now going to be making, by building a family, their contribution to the Jewish nation, right? Marriage is a new stage in life. Perhaps it can be, it can be understood this way. Before a person gets married, they are, they are, I don't want to use the word free, they're, they're less connected to the materialism of the world. Right? The Gemara tells the famous story about one of the sages, I believe it was Ben Azai. Ben Azai never wanted to get married. Why not? He wanted to sit and study Torah his whole life. He, wanted, he didn't want to be bothered. Don't bother me with responsibilities, right? With with being involved in the world. If a person isn't married, if a person isn't attached this way, then they're, they're, 
they're sort of, they live, they can live a, a less materialistic type of life. If the person is, is a spiritual person, they are, un, they are detached in that sense and free to pursue spirituality as much as they want. Getting married represents living, tying oneself down to living a more responsible life on a very practical level. When we say that the two sons of Aaron, Nodov and Avihu, um, didn't want to get married. In fact, they didn't. They said, we're the sons of Aaron, we're the nephews of Moshe, you know, etc. It was a sin on their end, granted. But they were tzaddikim. What were they really saying? What they really were saying was that they wanted very much to be able to live in the Beis HaMikdash, to, to serve Hashem, granted, on behalf of the Jewish people, to offer up sacrifices, to sit perhaps and study Torah in their free time, and not have to engage with the world in any responsible type of way. They didn't want that. They knew that if they were to get married, they would be held down. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't have as much time or as much mind space to pursue spirituality as they wished they could. Perhaps similar to the Jews not wanting to go into Eretz Yisrael altogether, just wanting to stay in the desert, arguing that a desert life was a more spiritually liberated and free life without having to interact with the world. Okay. When they say, you know, no one is good enough for us, Perhaps it doesn't just, perhaps it can, can be understood not just as an egotistical, arrogant thing, but, but a, a dream and a vision of theirs to pursue spirituality without limitations and just, and, 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 and just live a single life um, with, with, with all of its spiritual, uh, with, with all of its spiritual opportunities. The Torah says that on the first day, on the very first day that the Mishkan functioned, Nadav and Aviyu were taken from us. Their two brothers, Elozer and Isoma, remained. Nadav and Aviyu passed. It was as if Hashem said, in the Beis Hamikdash, we're only going to have Koihanim working here in the Mishkan. We're only going to have Koihanim working here who are married, who have families. You know, there's a, there's a, a similar halacha about this concerning a chazan on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Very interesting. It says that the chazan should, one of the criteria of the chazan is that he should be married and he should have children. Again, if there's nobody else, halachically you can take even a chazan that doesn't have children, a chazan that's not married. But ideally, the chazan should be somebody married with children. Why? It says because, because this way he can really daven. Now, what if you have a single person with a more beautiful voice? What if you have a single person who's more learned? What if you have a single person who's, who's more uh, spiritual in nature? Allah says no. Take the married family man, put a talus on his head, put him up there, let him daven on behalf of the community. Padafke him. Why? Because he's well grounded. He's, 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 because he can, the, the, the expression Allah is, he will daven from a place in his heart. The sincerity of his tefillahs will be much, will, will be much greater. On the first day that the Mishkan was set up, Nodav and Aviyu were taken from us. Hashem said no. Hashem said the Mishkan represents a place where godliness is not a concept. It's not lofty. It's not outer worldly. It's something that's experienced in a tangible, down to earth, 
way where people who engage in it are, you know, with their feet planted firmly on the ground, married men with families, you know, people, people who change diapers, people who, who pay tuition, people who engage in this level, in this way, in, in, in the most, with the most simple and technical mundane parts of life. I, I would even go so far as to say, not even if you weren't, I wouldn't even call it a punishment. Hashem said to them, look, if you want to be so spiritually detached, so, so detached from the physicality, Hashem says you cannot do that as you remain souls in bodies. So the souls leave, leave the bodies. The souls go up to heaven and uh, experience it completely uninhibited. The tachlis, the purpose, is experienced by souls in bodies. Nefesh, nefesh bukuf. Okay. Shimshon is a reincarnation of Nadav and Avi. We're, we're studying about Gilgulim and reincarnations on Shabbos. Shimshon is, is a reincarnation of them. The, wor- the rule with reincarnations is that, is that they have to fix what, happened in pre- what happens in previous lifetimes. So Shimshon's got to fix this. Excuse me. So he needs to get married. It's important to him to get married. It's... it's it's, it's a shlich, so he has to in, engage and, and interact, etc. It seems in Shimshin's case that he felt he needed to go to the opposite extreme. And not just engage, not just get married, but even take uh, an individual from the nations of the Goyim and marry them in order to truly, properly, uh, um, you know, fulfill his mission fulfill his mission in, in, in this world. In the words of Chazal, there's an expression, kol ha-gavoya b'yoyser, yorid l'mata yoyser. Kol ha-gavoya b'yoyser, yorid l'mata yoyser means the higher something is, the lower it falls. This rule, kol ha-gavoya b'yoyser, yorid l'mata yoyser, the higher something is, the lower it falls, can be understood both in a negative sense and in a positive sense. In a negative sense, when we say the higher something is, the lower it falls, we mean when it crashes, when it falls, up. the greater something is, if in fact it does fall apart and, 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 uh, and, and cease to function, the more of a destruction it is, right? When, when people fall from grace, the greater they were before they fell, the more is the humility, the more is the scandal, the, the, the bigger is the disaster. When it falls, it falls, it falls far. It, it falls bad. The analogy given for this, right, is that if, if a wall collapses, then the stones, the, the boulders, the rocks at the top of the wall, when the wall goes down, they fall the furthest from the original place of the wall. But there's also a positive element to it. Can also be understood as meaning the higher something is, the more it has the ability to go further down, lower down, and remain intact. You see, there's two ways of understanding it. One way is to say when something falls apart, when something destructs, the higher it was, the greater it was before the destruction the worse it is after the destruction. That's true. That's one element to it. There's another element to it. The higher something is, the more it has the ability to go further and not self-destruct. What do I mean? Take, take the classic example of a teacher, right? You have, you have a person who is, you have a person who is a very simple-minded person understands things very simply. You want, let's say you want to explain a very delicate, difficult concept to this person who has a simple understanding, a simple-minded person. You want to explain something very delicate and lofty and complicated to this simple-minded person. Who is going to be better? Who is going to be effective? Who is able to take a delicate, lofty, abstract concept 
and explain it to a person who's very simple-minded. Who can do that? So we all know that it takes the greatest of Chachamim and the greatest of teachers to take the most difficult ideas and explain it to the simplest of people. In fact, the more a person has mastery over the concept, the more, the wiser the person is, the more they're able to take that and bring it even to the minds of people who are the most simplistic, superficial understanding people. Only when you've truly mastered the idea properly can you then explain it to just about anybody or, or actually anybody. Teachers will often tell students, ah, this idea is too difficult for you to understand. <laughs> right? You can't understand this. It's too lofty for you. It's not for you. And what that often really means is that the teacher themselves doesn't truly master the idea. The teacher themselves is challenged with it, struggling with it. Sometimes the teacher will be honest about it. If they're, you know, if they're a, a transparent person, the teacher will say, look, even me, myself, I don't have a good enough grasp understanding of it. I cannot explain it to you. If my own understanding is insufficient, I cannot share it with others. Only when I've truly mastered it and the deeper is my mastery over it, the more I'm able to share that with others. The stronger a person is, the more they have the ability, the further they have the ability to last even in foreign environments and bring the, the truth and the light and the wisdom to the darkest of places. The Apostle says, a good name is better than good oil. A good reputation is better than good oil, right? The commentaries say. One of the meanings of that is that even Shem and Toiv, good smelling oil, with time, the smell becomes weaker. But a good reputation with time becomes stronger. That means when something is, is alive, a person with a good reputation who's who has earned a good reputation, who deserves it, right? He or she is the master of good deeds. The more, they're, the more they really are, the further their good reputation will spread. The more time goes by, the further it goes. Shimshin, the rabbis tell us, is a great tzaddik. He's an incredible tzaddik, in fact. He has the ability, in a spiritual sense, even to engage with these women, not just to remain a tzaddik, but to defend the Jewish people in the process. So to fix, as a tikkun for his own Gilgal Neshama, coming from Nodav and Avil, he's able to go all the way to the opposite extreme, to go and to marry these women who come from non-Jewish nations, to convert them with what's considered halachically a challenged conversion, and use all of this for the benefit, for the, for the benefit of, of, of the Jewish people. There's a Hasidic story they tell about the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov constructs a sukkah. The story goes, the Baal Shem Tov constructs a sukkah that is halachically very objectionable. Some of the greatest scholars who sit in the sukkah tell them your sukkah is not kosher. He relied on all sorts of halachic loopholes and, 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 and kulas and heterim, etc., etc. Anyways, the Baal Shem Tov argues with them. He explains to them why sukkah is kosher. All right. The end of the story is that the Baal Shem Tov produces a note from an angel in heaven testifying that his sukkah is kosher. Okay. But why? The Hasidic master said, why? Why would the Baal Shem Tov himself have to make such a sukkah? Every Yid wants to do mitzvahs in the best possible way, not in the worst possible way. Why would the Baal Shem Tov Badafka make a sukkah with so many vimezot, uh, with so many issues and problems? The answer is, the Baal Shem Tov, he did it on purpose. 
He wanted to elevate every possible kosher sukkah in the world. Right? The analogy that, that, they, that the Hasidic masters give for this, is they say, if you want to elevate, if you want to lift something, the heavier it is, the lower you have to put your hands. The heavier something is, you have to reach lower to the very bottom of it, and there you can, you can push and elevate the whole thing. So when the Baal Shem Tov seeks as a tzaddik, as one who, who seeks to connect with as many hidden, as many sukkahs as possible, he's going to make a sukkah that is at the very minimum level kosher. Kosher, but at the very minimum level kosher. Thereby in the process, pushing and elevating, so to speak, from the lowest of, and darkest of places. Why does Shimshin marry women? Not just to, from non-Jewish okay, non nations, he converts them. And then the conversion is challenged. In a spiritual sense, the reason for that is because he's going there on purpose. He's going to the darkest of places where a Jew can just possibly go. And Dafka over there to be the tzaddik that he is and to elevate as he's supposed to and, 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 and connect it to Hashem. Okay. Says the Balaturim, when Dina goes out, Leroy's Bivnoi Saoretz, to see the daughters of the world, this is similar to Shimshin going out, Shimshin being challenged, him going out to marry the women that he marries, um, just like Dina does. Perhaps the Balaturim can be understood to be, to be saying that the same applied to Dina. Dina also had this incredible ability. This, this call it, right, like the greatest of teachers. Like, what do you do if you have the greatest of teachers? The, great, the greatest master. Well, you can do two things. You can give the greatest teacher the greatest students. The greatest students will be enthralled by the wisdom of this greatest of teachers and they will appreciate it. You can also give the greatest of teachers the most simple of students because no one else will be able to teach these students other than this teacher. In the end, of course, the greatest of teachers need, need to do both. But the difference is that the greatest of students can learn from someone else, perhaps not as great as this person, but if they need to, they can learn from someone else. Whereas the most simple of students cannot learn from anyone else. Okay. Dina, the rabbis are telling us, had this ability as well. In the end, the reason why she goes out, Leroy Spivnoi Soritz, to see the daughters of the land, what propels her to go out this way is because somewhere deep within her soul, she can tell, she can feel that her shlichus, that her tafkid, that her, she has the ability to bring the light of Hashem and the light of the Jewish people to the darkest of places. And so she feels compelled to go out there and do so. Is she successful? Interestingly enough, the answer is yes, of, of, of course she is. Interestingly enough, by the way, I, I discovered a fascinating medrash I was unaware of. The rabbis tell us that in the end, Dina, Dina of course doesn't stay with Shem um, because Shimon and Levi wipe out the whole city. So who does Dina marry in the end? According to one opinion in the Medrash, Dina ends up marrying a man called Eoiv, a man called Job. There's, there's a lot to, there's a lot to unpack in that. I, I haven't fully thought that through, but, but, but there's a lot there. Dina ends up marrying Eoiv. Eoiv, according to the Talmud, was not Jewish. All right, this was before the giving of the Torah. This was before the Jewish people lived and went to, went to Egypt, etc. But it seems, again, in a spiritual sense, it seems clear. Dina is correct. Her destiny is to go and elevate sparks of holiness and Kedusha, even among non-Jews. And so she does. 
Yaakov, it seems, her father, her own father, doesn't see this potential in her, or doesn't see, in that sense, perhaps Dina is greater even than Yaakov, doesn't see this ability. Yaakov is scared. He doesn't want his children interacting too much with the negative forces of the world. Don't forget, he has a brother called Esau. He has an uncle called Yishmol. He knows that things can go badly. And so he, quote, puts Dina in a box and locks it. He's trying to hold her back. The Torah says Yaakov is punished. It doesn't say that Dina is punished because for Dina in a spiritual sense, it wasn't a punishment. I'm not saying that her abuse wasn't a punishment. I'm saying in a spiritual sense, it wasn't abuse. She could sense within her soul that she was destined to have an impact on the outside world. And so she went there knowing that she would be able to hold on to her integrity and, 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 and elevate these sparks to holiness. Yaakov doesn't see it in her. So as long as he can, he shields her and puts her in a box and locks it up. He's hiding her from Esau. The Torah says Yaakov was punished for this. Again, punishment can be understood here not as a slap on the wrist, but the Torah, the Torah is saying Yaakov doesn't see the full extent, the full potential of Dina's soul. And so later on, when Dina does go out, Yaakov is in pain. He's, 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 he's struggling with this. But yet, as is, with, as is with the way Hashem created and destined all of reality to go, Dina's spiritual potential is greater than that of Yaakov. Because she's Yaakov's child, because she's Yaakov's daughter, and has Yaakov and has all of Yaakov's potential plus her own, in the end, she herself does go out, and there she fulfills the mission which she came to the world. Okay. I want to tell you what I think is the lesson or the, the, the wisdom from all of this. We, we are simple people. We don't know our Gilgulim. We don't know who we were in, the, in our previous lifetimes. We don't know what it is really is our shlichus, our mission in this world. We don't, we don't know any of this. But sometimes we feel compelled. Sometimes we feel, we feel pulled for reasons we ourselves don't understand to engage with certain people, to, to, to engage in certain, you know, to, to head down certain paths, and we ourselves don't know, is this good for us? Is this bad for us? Is this a, a challenge? Is this an assoyan, a test we're supposed to overcome and not engage in? Or is this perhaps something that we are? And sometimes even we feel gifted in particular areas. And we wonder to ourselves, why? What am I supposed to do with these gifts? Or why am I so attracted? Why am I being pulled in this, in, 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 in this direction? The Torah tells us, Vatayte Dina, Dina was Yitzionist, Dina was an outgoing, she was extroverted, she was, she was looking for something, her soul was restless. Her soul was restless because she knew she had a mission to accomplish, and she was looking for an opportunity to do it. Sometimes when we feel pulled in a particular direction, the reason why we feel pulled there is because our soul can tell, is trying to tell us that we have a particular mission that we have to do in this place. Perhaps the reason why our neshamas came into this world is because we're supposed to engage with this. Now, of course, we're never allowed to do anything that's halachically even questionable. And we always need wise mentors and advisors in life who will help monitor and guide us in the right direction. Absolutely. But very often our subconscious souls will lead us and guide us into the direction that we're supposed to go because the soul knows that there's a mission here, there's a, there's a, there's a purpose here for something for me to accomplish. In Dina's case, as with, in, as with Shimshin's case, they were the first ones, ner lagoyim, if you will. They were the first ones who were able in a spiritual and physical sense to interact with the nations of the world and accomplish spiritually what it is that needed to be accomplished. In, in Shimshin's case, uh, he, he needed to protect the Jews, right? Etc. In fact, the rabbis even say that Shimshin was what came to the world to fix the sin of Odomarishim. 
one of the opinions in the Medrash is that Adam Rishon, the, the fruit that Adam Rishon ate in the in the in Gan Eden was a te'ena, was a fig. The Torah says te'ena humavakish. He was seeking out this fig. He could tell somewhere within himself that he was gifted in 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 this direction, and so he's he's attracted to it. He's being he's being pulled by it because his soul can feel that there's a need for me to engage with this. Again, in Shimshin's case, he was a great tzaddik. He knew what he was doing. In our case, we're mere mortals. We always need to seek guidance and direction. But when a person feels pulled in a particular, talented in a particular field, talent in a particular field needs to be developed. If not, it, it, it turns destructive inside the soul of the person. That means Hashem has given us this talent. That means the purpose of our living in this world is to develop it. To take that road and to engage with it and to, to take it and to, to see where it takes us to, ful to, fulfill our mission, uh, to fulfill our mission in this world. If we find that our road seems fraught with spiritual danger, this only means that Hashem has blessed us with additional strength to be able to overcome, to deal with these dangers and to be able to overcome them. Dina had this ability. Shimshin had this ability. In Dina's case, she had it even more than her own father could anticipate. All right, and that's my shir. Thank you for being here today. May Hashem bless us all and help us bless us all with a good Shabbos. May we encounter, um, may we encounter no scary challenges in our own path in serving Hashem. But if and when we do, let's always remember that Hashem has blessed us with the talents and the strength to overcome them. And our souls will guide us with Hashem's help in the right direction. Have a wonderful Shabbos.